All right, it's two o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. Good afternoon and welcome to our 2021 aphasia community event. My name is Lindsay Cater and I'm a speech language pathologist and a doctoral student here at the aphasia lab at the University of South Carolina. While we wish we could be celebrating together in person, we are thrilled to expand our outreach to people with aphasia, care partners, professionals, and students, both nationally and internationally. We're looking forward to sharing the next hour and a half together with you. We'll get started with a brief welcome from the director of the aphasia lab, Dr. Julius Friedrichsen to be followed by a presentation by Dr. Deborah Meyerson and her husband, Steve Zuckerman. We'll then welcome you all to share questions and answers with the presenters. And we'll close our time together with Play on Words, a performance by our Aphasic Drama Club here at the University of South Carolina. To start, I do want to extend a thank you to a few important individuals without whom today's event would not be possible. First, I wanna thank the Howard family. Mr. Murray Howard and Mr. Mac Howard have generously provided funding to the aphasia lab here at the University of South Carolina. Both Mr. Murray Howard and Mr. Mac Howard are proud University of South Carolina alumni Murray graduated in 1971 with a BA in journalism, advertising and public relations and received a master of arts in journalism in 1973. Mac Howard graduated with a BS from the Moore School of Business in 1973 and later received an MBA in 1974. Mac and Murray's father, Mr. Murray M. Howard Jr. suffered a stroke in 1977 and following his stroke, he was unable to return to his work as a chemist. Following his stroke, Mr. Howard lived with aphasia for 10 years and upon his discharge from the Roger C. Peace Rehabilitation Hospital of Prisma Health in Greenville, South Carolina, he slowly regained the ability to walk, dress himself, feed himself with the support of his care partner and wife, Josephine Elizabeth Sweet Howard. We are extremely thankful for this generous support. And again, today's event and much of the outreach we've been able to pursue, especially in light of the ongoing global pandemic is thanks to the Howard family. So we thank you again for your donation. We also wanna thank our collaborators and partners for this event from Stroke Onward. Primarily, we want to thank Dr. Deborah Meyerson and her husband, Steve Zuckerman, the co-founders and co-chairs of this foundation. We also wanna thank Executive Director Flannery O'Neill and Program Director Jody Kravitz. We encourage you to learn more about Stroke Onward and Deborah and Steve's mission by visiting the website here. I'm now gonna turn the mic over to Dr. Leanne Spell, the Associate Director of the Aphasia Lab. Oh, I love it. I have a drum roll. I'm Leanne Spell, I'm the Associate Director of the Aphasia Lab, as Lindsay just said, and we're so glad that you're here. We had, I think about 167 people registered online for this. So thank you all so much for being here. I know you're gonna really enjoy hearing from Deborah and Steve today. Uh, and we have lots of exciting things going on. One of the exciting things that we have going on is raffle prizes. So everyone who registered is in our raffle. I'm, I'm waiting for the prize patrol right now to um, send me who our first winners are. Um, but some things that we're gonna be giving away today, we have um, Deborah's book, Identity Theft, rediscovering ourselves after stroke. So we're gonna be giving away some copies of that. And for those of you who don't already have one of these coveted items, it's a Center for the Study of Aphasia um, Recovery t-shirts. So, oh, here's Prize Patrol. Okay. <laughs> um, so we've got some t-shirts to give away today. And the grand prize that we have um, is from our friends at Constant Therapy. Some of you may be familiar with 
them. They provide therapy activities, speech language and cognitive therapy activities through an online or subscription and they've donated a year subscription to us. So we're gonna be giving that away at the end of the session. Um, so make sure that you stay around for that. So our first winners, my prize patrol was just in here. There we go. Um, our first winner of the identity theft book is Gina Schiavoni. I hope I pronounced that correctly. So Gina, we're gonna be um, mailing this to you. And then the winner of the first t-shirt of today is Paige Davis. So congratulations to both of you for winning our first prizes um, this afternoon. All right, let's go on. I want to um, now introduce you to the director of the Aphasia Lab and the Center for the Study of Aphasia, uh, of aphasia Recovery, and that's Dr. Julius Fredrickson. All right, wonderful. Thank you, Leanne. So before we move on to the main presentation, I wanted to take the opportunity to thank everyone who made today's event possible. First and foremost, that would be Lindsay Cater, who you heard at the beginning, and now Leanne Spell. And I think that without their passion and enthusiasm for the, uh, to improve the lives of people with aphasia, we certainly wouldn't be having today's event and all the other events that we have, like our aphasia groups, our lunch bunch. Uh, so big thanks to uh, Lindsay and Leanne. I also wanted to take the opportunity to thank the members of our group, including Hank Atkins, who is our uh, jack of all trades, and Elise, who is our social media guru, and the grad students who made the promotional video for today. Uh, that was Elizabeth Stein, Delara Abedini, and Anya Derry. I thought the video was fantastic, and I hope that many of you saw it. Finally, I wanted to thank the members of our research team in the Aphasia Lab and at CSTAR, especially all the grad students who are currently working with us or who have worked with us over the past 20 years since we started this lab. Um, now to our main event. So we're honored to have with us uh, Dr. Deborah Meyerson and her husband, uh, Steve Zuckerman. Uh, uh, Deborah is an author, advocate, and a professor at Stanford University. Back in 2010, she had a stroke which resulted in aphasia. And in her most recent book, Identity Theft, Rediscovering Ourselves After Stroke, Deborah draws from her experience with life after stroke and how to help others who've suffered a stroke as well and those closest to them navigate the emotional journey that she had which was difficult, but also what she describes as being rewarding. Like I said in the presentation, Deborah is accompanied by her husband, Steve, who I noticed on their website actually used to be a student in Deborah's class. Anyway, uh, we're very fortunate to have them with us today. So uh, on to our main event. Hi, everyone. Uh, happy to be working here. Of course, we wish we were there in person, but glad this is working and look forward to chatting with you after you've seen the recording. My name is Deborah Meyerson. In 2009, I re began lectures at Stanford like this, confident, strong, and casual. I encourage students to explore topics like gender, race, diversity, and social change. My name is Deborah Meyerson. In 2011, these words came out weak and difficult to understand. But these words are a huge achievement. My stroke robbed me of all speech. My name is Deborah Meyerson. Singing still helps me unlock my words. Who is Deborah Meyerson now? I am alive for this. I'm grateful and lucky. 
many things have changed. I live with disabilities. My right hand doesn't work. I walk with a limp. My speech is really difficult. But some uh, things haven't changed. I share the same values, love the same family, work to the same determination. Losing my old life it was the hardest part of my stroke. Rebuilding my identity as a stroke survivor with disabilities is the hardest part of my recovery. My stroke took so much of in, in me. Independence, can, uh, control, my career, and so much more. But to me, I was the same person. So I had to get my capabilities back. Three, uh, for three years, I worked my ass out the hardest job I ever had. With all this work, I still re, uh, didn't regain all my capabilities. I couldn't be a Stanford professor anymore. My phaser, my speech didn't. Uh, let me do the job. Losing tenure was a huge blow. What do I do now? Who am I now? Three years after my stroke, my identity crisis began. Re, uh, writing this check five years. Uh, I am uh, really a uh, yeah, I had a lot of help. My personal journey to make sense of my new life. I, even more my new purpose to help others. This is not just my story. Well, will help. Uh, well, help. Help. I interviewed more than fifty-five people, to diverse ages, backgrounds, stroke types, and an experience of life and stroke. Every stroke is different. Every recovery is different. Every person is different. My uh, husband Steve will talk about the book. Thanks, Deb. Uh, so I am, as Deb said, her husband. Um, and also I describe myself as her care partner, as the person closest to her uh, during her recovery. Um, you know, deciding to write the book was one thing, um, but actually writing it with severe aphasia is very different. Um, but one thing about Deb that clearly hasn't changed since her stroke is her determination. So when she decided she was going to write a book, she just started to write a book. Um, but she quickly figured out that she needed help, and I was the closest person around and also the least expensive person around, um, so uh, I jumped in to try to help Deb, uh, but I also had a full-time job, um, so we realized we were going to need more help than that. We found a wonderful woman named Sally Collings, uh, who was an editor, uh, an author herself, 
um, lived nearby and got excited about working with Deb. And for about two and a half years, she really worked with Deb doing interviews and ultimately creating a full first draft. And it didn't quite carry the message that Deb was trying to convey. Um, our kids, we are, we are blessed with three great kids, all of whom are adults now, 25 to 31. Um, and they were about five years younger when this process started. Um, and they kind of pitched in and helped along the way. Um, but at that critical point, when we realized that the first draft didn't quite carry the message, our son Danny um, was between jobs and offered to step in and really help out and help Deb restructure the book and restructure the message. And, and he is uh, the, the named co-author on the book. Um, I'm going to share just a few more things about the book. Um, the first, and Deb talked about this, the importance of diversity. Um, we really didn't want this to just be Deb's story, um, partly because Deb's modest and doesn't like to put the attention on herself, but partly because we really wanted a lot of stroke survivors to be able to relate to the stories in the book, and everybody's story is different. Um, just by way of an example, there are 25 survivors included in the book, um, just a, a, a few of them. Mark lived in St. Louis. Um, he was 58 when he had his stroke. Um, his story was particularly uh, just emotionally draining. His, his son had been murdered and he had his stroke just a, about three or four days after that. Um, he was lucky that with rehab, he was able to go back to his work as an accountant. So he was one of the survivors that was able to go back to more of his pre-stroke life than some of the others. Um, Trish was a project manager for Apple, lived in the Bay Area. She was only 43. Uh, she, like Deb, um, suffers from pretty severe aphasia. She actually changed her life dramatically, moved to Florida mainly to lower her cost of living and be able to invest more of what she had in her recovery and live more comfortably on a reduced income. Um, she's super active. She golfs with one arm. She's very active in the aphasia community. She, she really is uh, just incredibly inspirational. Um, and then Manny was only 29 when he had his stroke. Um, and believe it or not, that's not the youngest person we interviewed. We interviewed one young man who was uh, in high school when he had a stroke. Um, but one of the things that was very interesting about Manny, and it speaks to the difference in each person's situation, is he talked a lot about the Filipino culture and how it's a, it's a culture in which men are expected to be strong and, and provide for and that many in his family really had a very difficult time, even more difficult than his, in realizing that he was going to have to be a different kind of father and a different kind of husband. So their stories are all very different, um, backgrounds, careers, degrees of disability, um, but there were some incredibly common themes in everybody we talked to. One was that they all worked incredibly hard and long to regain their capabilities. And we, from personal experience, are firm believers that, you know, keep working because even five, 10 years after the stroke, Deb is regaining capabilities. Um, and very central to the book Identity Theft and our work is that they were all offered a lot of help on the physical rehab but almost nothing on that emotional journey to rebuild their identity and rebuild their sense of self and their lives in the face of their disabilities. Um, the last thing I'll, I'll talk about specifically about the book is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And this was something um, that we used to frame a lot of our thinking and, and it really helped frame Deb's journey that, um, and this was not developed for survivors or for people suffering any kind of trauma. This was something developed in the 1940s by a social scientist who was really trying to describe what motivates people um, and that people are first motivated to meet their basic needs. You know, you need to survive. But if those needs are met, 
then most people start to focus on their psychological needs. Do they have self-esteem? Do they belong to a group? Do they experience love and belonging? And then when that need is fulfilled, they really look for their own self-fulfillment. How do they find purpose in life? How do they create that purpose? And Deb realized, having studied this when she was in her early 20s, that as a stroke survivor, there was no reason she couldn't get back on this same pyramid in the very early days after her stroke. It was all about survival and basic needs. But as she began to recover, there was no reason she couldn't continue to try to strive for psychological needs and self-fulfillment needs. Um, one of the other things about the book that, that was really important to Deb and really important to us um, was that it's not just the survivor that's affected, so is the family. And we, the, the title of chapter nine in the book is Stroke is a Family Illness. We borrowed that phrase uh, from a woman named Leora Cherney, who's become a very close colleague. Um, she, among other things, she developed the intensive aphasia program at the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab. Um, and this, that was the title of the very first slide she gave to family members who accompanied stroke survivors to their program. And that notion rang so true for us. And we talk a lot as a family about, and we had to in our journey, talk about how it was affecting all of us. And our three kids um, were really wonderful in their processing of this journey along with us. And I, tear up all the time when I even start to talk about chapter nine, which begins with a story of a talk our daughter gave when she was in her last year of high school, which was two years after Deb's stroke, in which she really shared with her whole school community the journey that she went through first, really thinking she had to be strong and Deb was her role model and strong me to, it meant I didn't need help and I could do it and I could gut it out. She was an athlete, so she was used to that kind of hard work. But gradually, largely because she saw Deb out of necessity accepting help in ways she never had before, given her fierce independence, um, and Sarah started to accept help and started to let her friends into her life and share more. And she talked about how she really changed her view of what it meant to be strong through the process of trying to internalize Deb's stroke and our family's journeys through it. So a lot of what we do really is to focus on not just the survivor, um, but also, uh, also the, the people in the family with the survivor. Um, and then the last thing I'll say, I think I may have said the last thing once before, okay. sorry about that, um, is really not about the, the book itself, but the book writing journey. Um, and when we first started giving talks about the book, I realized, and, and I don't think we had realized it while we were writing it, that the book itself really reflected Deb's journey in recovery. Um, and at the beginning, when Deb said she wanted to write a book, it really was, I had to give up my job at Stanford, but I'm still an academic. And what do academics do? They write books. So I'm going to prove that I'm still me. But as she got into the book writing process, she very quickly saw, as she said earlier, that the book writing process was a way for her to go through her own journey to, to take that emotional journey in recovery. And pretty quickly she realized, and we talked about the fact that nobody told us we had to go on that journey. Nobody really gave us resources to help us on that journey. And that that was true for pretty much all the other people we had interviewed. And so this book really was an opportunity to help others, to create a resource that might help others. And there were several times during the book writing process, I mean, it was actually an incredibly gutsy thing for Deb to write this book because it it put her in the face with her most frustrating disability every single day and there were many times when she just threw up her hands and said I'm done I, I don't care I'm not finishing this book 
but it was refocusing on that purpose that, ah, damn it, there are people out there who, like me, didn't get any help and they need it. And that really rings to a really important part of our message, which is in recovery, finding a purpose, and, and it doesn't have to be professional, it can be with your family, but finding purpose is an incredibly powerful motivator. So Deb said earlier that understanding identity was really at the core of her journey, uh, as it was for our whole family. So we're going to go a little deeper into that, into that journey. Um, the, if we were doing this live, we'd probably do this as a little bit of an exercise. We, we try to get people to think about this question of who are you? And we would ask you how you describe yourself. And if we were in a room, we'd ask people to pair up with one or two people near them and just talk about that. How do you describe yourself in 30 seconds? And then when we come back together and debrief a little bit what people said, and you can sort of think a little bit about what you would say if, if you were asked to tell the person sitting next to you how you describe yourself. We then challenge people a little bit. Would what you have, what, what you said, would that be the same thing your best friend would have said or your spouse or your partner or your kids or your colleagues? Do other people see you the same way you see yourself? And would you have said the same thing 10 years earlier or 25 years earlier or for some a little further in age like us, 40 years earlier? And similarly, did you describe yourself by what you do, your career, maybe your role as a parent? Did you describe by how you act or your values, what you care most about? And so that hopefully gets you thinking a little bit. And now I'm going to pass it back to Deb, who did have to give up her faculty position, uh, but that doesn't mean she doesn't still like to teach. So Deb, take it away. Thank you. Um, I'd like to, uh, uh, I'd like four things about identity is really important. Before that I talk about identity, I, mm. I want to see it as process of comparing to to talk like this I have so much to share it's really difficult for me the hardest part of well, the phasia is struggling to say want to act to say And work and let. Take a little drink. Yeah. Uh, to to uh, here, we write the content. Steve helps. I practice for hours to make it speakable. Even then, I can't say all that I want to say. See the seers the most and complicated and materials. I I uh, ha, am uh, so glad he can that I get mad at him a lot when we work together. I knew it's not mad at me, him, but mad at my situation. This is life now, but I won't let my aphasia seal my voice. Like she said, 
having a purpose and meaning is the best way to fight through my frustrations. So here I go. Let's talk about identity. We all have many identities. I had to remember that I am more than a job at Stanford. I am a mother, wife, daughter, and friend. <clears throat> I love sports. I had to think about all the things I makes me me. <clears throat> Denny's changed. We are changing all the time. W right before this stroke, I was a, not the same person I was four, five years before. My stroke changed me faster, but I am changing anyway. The identity is strokes, 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 social construct. We are who uh, are in the concepts of relationships. My relationships, my family and friends are key in rebuilding my life. Most important, Danny is the choice. Instead of asking who I, I am now, ask who do you want to be now? And my, her, your sense of self, her, your identity is profoundly affected of your situation, uh, your gender, race, and ethnicity, and more. So um, I mentioned um, purpose, and when we got to the end of writing the book, um, we realized that, that that couldn't be the end and that there was more to do. And so uh, Deb and I decided to start a nonprofit to really push this work around identity and rebuilding identity and the kind of resources that might be available for stroke survivors now and in the future uh, to help with that part of recovery. And if the technology works, we're going to play a little video that just introduces, uh, you'll see some familiar slides, but introduces the work we're now doing through an organization called Stroke Onward that we created about a year and a half ago. And let's see if this works. In 2010, Deborah Meyerson was a professor at Stanford University, working on issues like gender, diversity, and identity. I'm really happy to be here. I actually, I spoke at an impact conference. She was also a happily married mother of three, healthy, fit, and athletic. Then, a severe stroke nearly killed her, leaving her paralyzed on the right side and with no speech at all. For three years, Deborah pursued every avenue for therapy possible. Despite great progress, she could not return to her job as a professor, mostly because of her ongoing speech challenges. That led Deborah to ask, who am I now? Drawing on her background studying identity, Deborah and her family began to explore their identities and the emotional journey they now know was critical to rebuilding a rewarding life in the face of disabilities. 
That was an integral part of the five-year process to write identity theft, rediscovering ourselves after stroke. More than a book about Deborah, identity theft is built on academic research and interviews with more than 50 survivors, family care partners, and professional caregivers. While writing the book, Deborah and her husband, Steve Zuckerman, heard time and again that survivors and their families get little help navigating their emotional journeys. So they have created a nonprofit called Stroke Onward to bring awareness, develop resources, and ultimately change caregiving systems to embrace the emotional journey as an integral part of the recovery process. Deb and Steve are adapting their life personally and professionally to continue enjoying what they love and by building Stroke Onward, trying to make the stroke recovery system better for the millions who will, unfortunately, be forced onto that path in the years to come. Please join us to learn, collaborate, and create a better healthcare system together. So that was um, uh, a little video that uh, a group for whom we did a kind of a corporate talk uh, helped us produce. Um, and just in the interest of time, I'm not gonna spend much time on these slides, but just super quickly, our, our focus with Stroke Onward is really threefold. One is to build awareness, um, just so that people know this is an important issue in the recovery. And one of the most significant things we've got going is we were invited by the American Stroke Association to write a, I never know if it's semi-monthly or bi-monthly, but every two months, a column for their Stroke Connection newsletter and website to really talk about issues related to this emotional journey and rebuilding identity. We've, we've written three so far, and uh, we'll have another one coming out in about a month. Um, a second uh, real focus for us is, is actually developing resources that can be helpful. One of the first things we've been working on is to create book discussion guides for the book Identity Theft so that different groups can meet and talk about it. Just trying to make it easier for people to talk about this. So we've really got five different guides in, in the works. They'll all be similar, but tailored to different groups. Um, Probably the hardest is the one for survivors with aphasia, where communication is a challenge. Um, and we've had some wonderful partners at, at BU and Cal State East Bay working with us. Uh, they run intensive aphasia programs working with us to develop that. Um, uh, uh, one for other survivors, one specifically for care partner groups, one for professional caregivers, and then sort of a general population book club. We call it the, the Oprah version. Um, and we're also working, we've noticed that in a lot of stroke recovery guides that are given out by hospitals, um, the American Stroke Association and others, that there really isn't much in there about this. There's talk of the physical rehab, there's talk of the navigating the world, there's talk of the medical side. Um, there is talk of, you know, if people are clinically depressed getting help, but for that, large group of people who aren't clinically depressed, but just know they've got to work on their emotional journey. There's really not much in there. So we're working on some stuff that we might be able to um, get added. And then the third area is influencing the caregiving approach. We really hope that we can make just a little dent so that a stroke survivor 10 or 15 years from now and their families experience a very different environment in the healthcare system um, and so we're working on a couple things, including some curriculum development. Would it help to put more about this topic in the training curriculum for uh, people who are studying to be speech therapists, physical therapists, occupational therapists, neurologists, et cetera? Um, so that's some of the work we're doing. And I'm going to pass it back to Deb to finish this up, and then we'll get out of the recorded presentation and hopefully have a time to chat with all of you. People ask me what, what, 
help me oh no, no. Uh, he's helped it, me a lot look forward but take time to accept your uh your love uh my loss the focus on small wins they add up we uh, they help me we built which probably means focusing on the most important things in life not regaining my old life. I can always grow as a person. Focus on, on meaning and purpose. Tracy is support in my life. My husband, and family, good friends, for some, it's religion. It helps, uh, whatever helps me, you know. And most important thing, anything, is uh, really, uh, really uh, realizing my emotional journey, rebuilding identity is really important. My journey is full of challenges. I'm building a different kind of career. I have new limits, but I am again an active mother, partner, and athlete. I am still rebuilding my identity and rebuilding my life. So who am I now? I'm a stroke survivor. I get frustrated, really frustrated, but I'm lucky to be alive. I have great support, but I, I, I am building a new life and I have purpose again. I am committed to uh, to help uh, other survivors and their care partners. To be clear, we are not figured it out. We, we are still on the journey and we will be with life. Thank you. Thanks for having us, and we look forward to talking about your questions. Thank you, Deb and Steve. We are now going to um, go into our question and answer period. And I would suggest, I, I see a lot of our participants and students on, so I, I would bet that you are like them and that you've become a Zoom professional over this past year. But if you don't know about how to get speaker view, that's what I would recommend you go into now because I'm gonna be asking Deborah and Steve some questions that were submitted through registration. We had some great questions. So if you'd like to be able to see Deb and Steve a lot better, go up into the right-hand corner of your screen and click on view and then click on speaker. And then you're gonna be able to see um, whoever's speaking at the time. So let's see, what else did I wanna say? Also, I, uh, we did mention this at the beginning. We, like I said, we had a lot of great questions at the beginning of um, when, with pre-registration. So Deborah and Steve are gonna answer those first. If you'd like to ask a question, please um, type it in the chat room. And if we have time, um, we'll, get, we'll get to those at the end. So we wanna to try to get answer as many questions as possible. And we're gonna start with the ones that were submitted previously. So the first one, and I'm just gonna read these, um, Deb and Steve, because we didn't want to um, switch back and forth between the slideshow and, and you all. So the first question is, what advice would you give a care partner right after a loved one has a stroke with aphasia? 
And I think as the care partner, I'll I'll grab this one. Um, and I, I always say I am so reluctant to give advice because as we and Deb talked about, everybody's experience is so different and how you go through this. But a couple of just observations that were important for me. One is just always remember it's a marathon, not a sprint. If you kind of burn yourself out, then you're not there to help your partner who's who's struggling with stroke recovery. Um, and part of that is just taking care of yourself. Find the ways that you need to keep yourself physically healthy and mentally healthy, um, wh whatever that is is for you. Um, we talked. Uh, we talk a lot about, or or I talk a lot about something called the ring theory of support, which was introduced by a social scientist. Just that, for me, I'm sort of a natural pleaser, and I want to help everyone. So often, the people around who were kind of, I, I'd want to help them. And I I realized by thinking about this idea of circles, Deb in the middle, me in the next ring, maybe our kids and Deb's mom in the next ring. But if you always focus your energy on helping the people further inside the circle, um, that's really what you need to do. And, and I think that was super helpful for me because it gave me permission that if somebody was sort of looking for my help other than Deb, I could say, no, I, I've got to focus on Deb and that I could ask for help from anybody who was in a ring outside of me. So that was kind of something that was super helpful for me. Um, Another is just that, you know, on this whole topic of the identity journey, I had to go through that and still do as well. My, it's not just that my life changed because I have to help Deb, it's my identity changes as a care partner for someone with stroke and how much I embrace that really affected kind of how I navigated through, you know, the, the 10 years since, since Deb's stroke. Um, we've been using the phrase care partner and I think um, that was kind of a conscious choice on our part. And I think um, our colleague Jody was the first to kind of identify that, that that really says a lot that, you know, caregiver feels like a very one way term. Um, and our life was built as a partnership and we wanted that to continue. And so in this process, we really want to think of, of I want to think of myself as a care partner, not a caregiver. Um, and the last thing I'll share is just, um, I came up with what I call the six magic words, and I kind of say shame on me that it took me three years to figure them out. Um, but sometimes you don't know when to help. And sometimes Deb would get mad at me because I wasn't helping soon enough and she was struggling. And other times I'd jump in to help and she'd get mad at me because she wanted to do it herself. Um, and so just by like using the words, would you like me to help? Um, just saved us so many fights <laughs> and so much aggravation. So I, I throw that out there as, a, as an idea others might use. Very nice, great advice. All right, I think the next one might be uh, directed more at Deb. How long after your stroke was it before you got the idea to write the book? Um, uh, three and a half years. Um, I am uh, the uh, uh, when I couldn't be back to the job at Stanford. Mm -hmm. It's really uh, writing a book is I can do. N not, yeah. It was a natural progression, right? From, from what yeah, you did yeah. before. Yeah, okay. Here's the next question. Were there, this kind of relates to that last one, were there any roadblocks that occurred while writing your book? Yes, really a lot. <laughs> um, uh, tons of roadblocks. I needed so much help. I hated it a lot. I hated it uh, so much. I uh, didn't do myself. Uh, so I am, uh, uh, I am uh, uh, not, uh, but I, I almost stopped many times. I uh, really, I am really frustrated but but 
uh, thinking uh, it helps uh, other people. That's great. That's great. Thank you. All right. The next question um, is a little bit longer, but I want to read it to you so you can hear the, the whole thing. This person wrote, I had two mini strokes on September 13th, 2016, while I was working at the Olympic Games in Rio. After four and a half years, I'm getting better. For my next adventure, I want to be a motivational speaker. What advice do you have and where can I find small groups and conferences to present? And I, and I think Leanne, there was another question just a little further down about learning to strengthen speech and skills to become a motivational speaker. So really to, mm -hmm. to answer both of those, I think, um, you know, one of the things that's been super helpful for Deb along the way is finding a therapist who really understood what her goals were and could structure her therapy around that. Um, you know, just if you're trying to speak and you have aphasia, if you have someone in your life that can help you formulate your thoughts and practice. Um, we've heard a lot of people, Deb hasn't actually used this, but we've heard of a lot of people who have used the Toastmasters program, yeah. which is designed for just general speech giving skills, but that um, there are some Toastmaster groups that specialize, have special sessions for people with aphasia or just people with aphasia, join them as part of the process. Um, and, and I think for anybody thinking about doing it, the thing I would say is just don't underappreciate how motivating it is for people to hear you pushing through your aphasia to deliver the message you want. And I think people tell Deb that all the time. And it's so tempting to think you should only speak if you can do it the way you used to. But in fact, being willing to share your important voice through the aphasia. Um, and, and the vulnerabilities. Yeah, being willing to be vulnerable is role modeling something really important to people. Um, so don't, don't feel like you got to get it perfect to do it. Very nice, very nice, thank you. The next question reads, I'm a stroke survivor, highly functioning, and I'm only 50 years old. Most assisted living is made up of 90 year olds. Do you know of any assisted living centers for stroke people with aphasia like me who are very capable but need a little bit of help? I, I think we kind of have to plead that's not our area of expertise. <laughs> um, we haven't really done that research and I don't, unless you know something I don't know, Deb. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, whoever asked that we're question. We're gonna pass on that one. We, you can pass on some, that's fine. <laughs> All right, the next one. I need to learn about strengthening my speech and speaking skills. Um, and that kind of, you did answer that one already. Um, how long were you seeing a speech therapist? I'll go on to that one, Deb. Oh, um, uh, uh, um, um, I still am. I still am. Uh, 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 I know ten years before uh, since my stroke. I uh, uh, really the depends on that uh, presentation. Um, I like uh, 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 first, the uh, the uh, uh, the the hospital. No, the the uh, first the the hospital uh, uh, offered. Then uh, one year after my uh, 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 stroke is the melodic intonation therapy in Boston and uh, four months of really trying to sp speak and uh, learn to say my name. And uh, in six years, I really, uh, really, uh, uh, 
uh, Shirley, you, Ryan, uh, the Kent's a pro uh, program in Chicago two times. Uh, and uh, and I, I love the life participation uh, approach to aphasia. Now, uh, now uh, the therapist, the theater experience, focusing on the, my presentation style. So you've done a, a wide variety of different types of therapy. So, yeah. yeah. And, and one thing I'll just add the and this was particularly true for Deb with the melodic intonation therapy um, is one of the big challenges is often, even if you have insurance, they stop paying for therapy after a while. So how to access it is tough. And um, for Deb, the, the MIT, it was a clinical trial. So there are trials going on very often, and that can sometimes be an opportunity to get a lot of therapy that you don't have to pay for. Um, and something that that you kind of have to look for. And um, by the way, we do have clinical trials going on here at the University of South Carolina. Thank you for that segue, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you if you're interested in getting involved, I'll tell you towards the end of the session how to do that. Um, I'm laughing because everyone says I'm always plugging the aphasia lab, but I am, that's my job and I'm just excited about it. <laughs> um, you actually kind of led into the next question too. How did you find targeted speech therapy to meet your needs? And do you know anything about intensive speech therapy programs? So how did you decide which, which treatments or therapies to, to try or, or who to see? Uh, are we, uh, I, uh, I uh, right at all. <laughs> I, mean, I think, you know, at first we were focused more locally and for what we could get insurance to cover. Um, the melodic intonation therapy was a great opportunity. We happened to have one of Deb's closest friends in Boston that she could live with um, to do that. Um, the intensive aphasia programs, and you all know better than we do, there are a bunch of them around the country. Um, sometimes they're tough to access because of where they are and the cost of them, but that was super helpful for, for Deb and for us. So it's just keep looking for what fits your need and can fit your budget. And we're firm believers that you can keep getting better indefinitely. So don't stop. And that's what we tell everyone who participates in our, our um, studies too, is, is we know people who are years and years and years post-stroke, we can continue to see progress. So I love to hear you saying uh, that. I, uh, t 10 years, I am still uh, uh, getting better. Great. I love to hear that. All right. A I have a couple more um, previously submitted. I'm looking at my time so I can, um, maybe we can get in a couple from the chat. Um, how do I get self-motivated to practice the skills I need? Uh, um. I am hard uh, uh, working in nature. My uh, uh, three years, I am uh, vinegar goals and the, the purpose and meaning. I'm uh, Get, uh, get, help. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think for Deb, one kind of the hard work early on just came naturally. She like, in fact, a lot of therapists had to tell her to slow down and do less because it wasn't really helpful. Um, but then, you know, this whole thing that she talks about meaning and purpose, it's sort of what drives her through the frustration and says, okay, this hard work is a means to an end. Um, and, and that's what kind of helps keep her at it. Yeah. Very nice. Thank you. Um, 
Let's see. And you've kind of touched on some of these, but I don't know if either one of you want to add anything. How has Deborah's stroke impacted relationship, marriage, social, spiritual? Do we have, is this a two day seminar? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Tell us that in 10 minutes or less. <laughs> um, I like to say, uh, uh, Sarah is uh, my uh, daughter. Uh, she is uh, six years ago. She invited to the senior prom. Uh, uh, we uh, they started dating. She ne never had a boyfriend before. Steve talked, said, I could have a talk. The talk. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we, we were in the kitchen, I, and I said, boyfriend, uh, she said. Wait, no, no. You said boy, boyfriend. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, I said pregnant. No. <laughs> <laughs> and I think hey, it's it, it, we just all burst out laughing, and we've referred to it as the the world's most efficient mother daughter talk ever. And in fact, a number of our friends borrowed it, even though they didn't have any speech issues. And I think it really is just a story we tell because, you know, for two years, Deb felt like she wasn't being a mother um, because she was fighting for her life and getting better. And this was really the first place where she sort of regained that role of mother. And it was very different than the way she had been a mother before. And I think when we think about relationships, that's one of the things it's like, if you really understand what's important about the relationship, but give yourself permission to say, we're gonna find that in different ways than we used to. There are very few relationships that you can't regain and rebuild just differently. Um, and we just love that story. <laughs> we laughed hard. I love that too. I think our, our kids, my kids and your kids are about the same age. So I like that too. Um, well, that's all that I had for the, um, did I miss any that you guys had on your list for the pre-submitted questions? I think we hit all of those. So remember, if you'd like to ask them a question, we do have about five or so minutes left. I see one in the chat and I'll go ahead and, and start with that. If anyone else has a question, go ahead and type it in the chat. Um, so the next one is, um, hi, how did you, how did speech therapy influence your feelings about your journey and outlook? So how did your therapy influence your journey? Uh, I, uh, it's really a lot of hard work really a lot of hard work and frustration and uh, meaning meaning to uh, to and purpose mm -hmm. and, I, and I think for us speech therapists in particular have influenced our thinking and our journey a lot because as a survivor with aphasia we naturally, we stayed connected to speech therapists in ways that we might not stay connected to other people in the healthcare profession. And so we were fortunate to meet and work with a lot of speech therapists who both were very open to talking to us about this emotional journey path and some people who really just internally understood that. They may not have used those words, but kind of helped us along that path. So um it's been super helpful and uh, uh laura and uh, leora yeah, and uh, uh uh liz and really a lot and ellen and 
really, really a lot of some really good therapists. Yeah. And speaking of Leora, I can put a plug in for her right now too. She yeah. asked before um, the presentation if if we could share about a study that she's doing with people who have aphasia. Um, she's doing a survey study. She's based at the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab in um, Chicago, as uh, Steve mentioned earlier. And if you go to our Facebook page, which I'll share with you at the end of this session as well, um, we have a link to her study. If, if um, you're interested, if you're a person with aphasia and you would like to participate in her study, she would appreciate it. Um, we, we researchers want to learn how to help people recover from aphasia um, the best way possible. So any, anything that you can do, we have fantastic um, participants here in, in South Carolina. So we love it when anybody can help us out with that. So thank you. All right, I'm gonna do one more question. I have one more question on the chat and then we're gonna let you guys rest a little bit. And then we, I think we've got our, our drama club is waiting in the winds, in the wings, sorry. All right, the last question is, I speak fairly well, but can't remember words, or I say wrong words. Is this aphasia? Yes. <laughs> should let the experts answer that question. I think everybody who has aphasia who's listening right now will say, yep, that sounds like aphasia to me. <laughs> and, they, and like you said, it, it can be very frustrating, even, when you make it made as much progress as you have made, it's still very frustrating sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Thank well, you. thank thank you. Um, do you have any other any other words of wisdom before we let you go for the next part? Steve uh, is the uh, not. Uh, Steve is uh, aphasia. Steve is. The uh, words are not. Are you saying I? I think she's saying I don't have aphasia, which means I use too many words and I should shut up more often and and talk more quickly. But that's yeah, that's been true my whole life. So sorry, Deb. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. I'm going to give you guys a break for a little bit. Um, and, and they're still going to be on, so um, we're going to wrap up here at the end. So we will, we'll thank them at the end. But I, I want to thank you very much for for doing the pre-recorded talk for us, and also for the Q and A. We really enjoyed thank it. Thank you. Okay. So the next thing that we're going to do, I've got a quick prize. It's raffle prize time again. My prize patrol. We've got people working all over the place here. Our prize patrol for gave me the names just now. And the winner of the next t-shirt is Connie Wheatley. And the winner of the copy of the book, for Identity Theft, um, Rediscovering Ourselves After Stroke is James Jett. So congrat congratulations to both of them for the, the door prize. All right, so I'm now going to turn it over to Dirk Denouden and Peter Duffy. The book is the, the, the book is uh, uh, audible. Oh, it's an audible now too. Thank you for mentioning that. Yeah, so you can you can listen to it or get it in hard copy as well. Thanks. So thank you, Leanne, and thank you, Deborah and Steve, for the talk. Um, I'm really happy to introduce our uh, our drama uh, group. Um, we started this uh, two years ago. Uh, we did a performance then with um, uh, actors Marcus and, and Buffy and Charles, and they are still part of the group as well. And I have to say this, uh, as a researcher for me, this is one of the highlights in my week. We have continued to uh, practice and rehearse and do uh, drama exercises led by Dr. Peter Duffy, who's a colleague um, in the Department of Theater and Dance. Um, I just sent everybody off to a breakout room and got them back so that they could quickly warm up. And what I'm going to do um, after this is uh, to let Peter take over and, 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 and the group. And, and they are going to show you, give you an insight into the kind of exercises that we do as a group uh, every week. So we meet every Wednesday. Uh, now on Zoom, we're really hoping to get back to uh, in-person uh, 
uh, exercises and practices and rehearsals again, but for now we're just meeting on, on Zoom. Um, and um, we're going to show you, uh, we're going to give you a taste of uh, what we typically do. Before I do that, if someone can move the slide to the next one, um, I want to uh, ask the people who are not in the drama group, so if you're not one of the actors, uh, then it's, it hel it's helpful if you turn off your video for now, so that we can, if you, if you turn your view to gallery view, that we can see all the actors. So that means if you go again up right on most screens where you see view, um, and then instead of speaker view, if you now click on gallery view, then you should be able to see all the uh, actors in the group. So actors, please activate your cams. And non-actors, please turn off your videos. And I present to you with much pleasure, Play on Words, an aphasic drama group. Thank you, Rush. Thank you, Dirk. Um, so I've had the pleasure of working with um, this group for, like Dirk said, the last two years. And we decided that we would share a couple of exercises that we do with you. Um, the first year we worked together and we created a, a, an hour long play based on the experiences that the, the uh, participants had and what they wanted to let the world know about what their experience with aphasia is and what they kind of wanted to teach the world about what life with aphasia was like and um, what they wanted us to understand about that. Um, and um, so that was the first year's project. And this year we've just been um, having fun trying to figure out how to do this work through Zoom. Um, so we're gonna do a small example where uh, we're going to do an object transformation where everyone uh, in the group has a pen and uh, we're going to just pass it around and that pen has to become something else. In the so group. In, yeah. in the group, yes, in the group. So I'm going to say, I'm, I'm going to, like last time, I'll send my object to Marcus. Okay. So. Nice. What a looking guy. <laughs> Uh, Here it is, Marcus. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> oh, no. oh, no. All right. Got it. <laughs> Mike. Mike. Oh. I got it, Mike. All right. It it's James. Anyway, let's see. Getting my hair cut. All right, there you, you go. There you go, Van. I'm gonna comb my beard a little bit with my <laughs> comb with <the> beard. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna pass it to let's see. Okay. Hey. Charles. Huh? Charles. How about Charles getting yeah. Got it, Charles? I got it. It doesn't work. You <laughs> <laughs> get the philosophy. Okay. Give it to Buff. Buffy, I think your connection is is got. There we go. Sorry. That's all right. Could you 
give it to Annalise? Yeah. Annalise. Thank you, Buffy. Thank you. <laughs> I'll give it back to you, Peter. All right, great. Thank you very much. Excellent. Um, and another thing that we do is we work on um, improv skills. And yesterday in our session, we had an improv where um, people, we were on a plane and we had to figure out um, what our relationship to everyone was who was in the scene with us. And so we're gonna have two, two different scenes about being on a plane. Um, and in one group, we're gonna have Marcus, Mike, Van, and Annalise. And in the other group, we'll have Charles, James, Buffy, and Anya. All right, so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll move over to, uh, to coach class on the, on, on the plane. So can we have, uh, could we have Marcus, Mike, Van, and Annalise? go first. So sure. we remember we have to focus on relationship and place. There, there. Hey, is it your first class uh, uh, seat? There's no first class. There's no first class seat in there. Yes. Hey, whoa, whoa, you kind of lead you close to me, too close. Our aircraft does not have a first class sheet because everybody operates the same way. How do you, how do you, how do you get here in air, this airplane? How do you get on this airplane? That's not a problem. Is all, you do, all you gotta do is pay the bill and you get on. It's bumpy. Hey, yeah, it's bumpy. Drive in this. Hey. Can I get it off? Can I get it off? Yes. I get it? I'll get it off. I don't know. No. Oh, no. <laughs> Marcus, here's a parachute. Oh, thank you. Oh, gosh. I need that. <laughs> it was so small in that plane. We had to get off. Oh, no. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> Me too. 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 <laughs> Excellent. Well done, everybody. Thank you. Uh, and for our next uh, for our next group, we're going to have Charles, James, Buffy, and Anya to see what situation they have on the plane. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the beautiful sunny Bahamas. I'm going to check everyone's passport to make sure that you can get off the plane. Excuse uh -oh. me, sir. Is your name Charles? Yes, here you go. Thank you. Thank I'll you. Check your passport. Looks great. Thank you. Um, and you, sir, could I see your passport, please? Is it James? Yes, that's me. Could I, see I got your passport? first class. I got first class. Oh, you're in first class. Great. Yes. Wonderful. Could I see your passport, please? Uh, let me see. I got the I got my car on there on my phone. Does that work? Well, I think we're going to need something with a picture since we're international. My picture. Can not see my picture right here? I, that could work. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm selfie. Can you see my selfie? You could. You could take. You could take a small picture. I mean, we could make you a passport. Okay. Oh, I got one. I got. I found it. Oh, perfect. Even yeah. better. Yeah. Here's here's another quarter too. You can have it. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. And ma'am, do you have your passport with you? Let's see. Oh, I don't see her. <laughs> Excuse me. Since I first class, can I get a free free refill? 
I I guess I guess we could give you a free. I'm first refill. class. Normally I get the free li- re- free li- real. Fit. Well, sir, it's supposed <laughs> to come with one complimentary drink. No, uh, no, first class. You get all of it. We, See, I no, think we, I got dinner there in a minute. I, I think we, we can make an exception. I thought it was was getting off. You're welcome to get off, sir. I checked your passport. You're do you are just fine. Thank you. Goodness gracious. <laughs> Excuse me, before I go to the uh before I get the fly, I need to go to the bathroom. Can I go? Sir, would it be okay for you to go to the bathroom when you got off the plane? Can I go in the plane? <laughs> <laughs> we are trying to to unboard the plane, but you're welcome to get <laughs> and and maybe that's a good place to leave it. <laughs> uh, so that's a small example of the silliness that uh, we we have every week. Thank you so much, group. Great job. And I'm going to turn it over, turn it back over to uh, Lindsay and Leanne. All right. Thank you so much, Dirk and Peter and the Drama Club. And I just have to say, we have, I've mentioned this already, but we have fantastic partner uh, uh, participants, but we also have fantastic students. And, and every time I'm dropped in on a drama club, that's exactly what happens is everybody ends up in all kinds of laughter and, and everyone has a great time. So I'm gonna give you information about that um, before we go as, as well, if you're interested in, in joining us in that. Right now, uh, as Derek and Peter said, it is online. Um, it's even more fun in person. So we can't wait until we can all get, get together and, and do that again. I have, um, we are doing so well on time. I'm so, so proud of us on this. So I have our last raffle prize. And this is the Constant Therapy one year subscription to Constant Therapy. And the winner of that is Olaf Mueller or Muller. I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly. So congratulations to, oh, congratulations to Olaf. He will receive one year subscription to Constant Therapy. So very nice, very nice. Um, before we go, we do want to um, thank some of our collaborators and sponsors. Uh, certainly think we wanna thank Deb and Steve for sharing their story with us. They do a lot of talks. This is how I found out about them is I saw them um, when they spoke for an aphasia access um, presentation. So once I saw them, I said, we need to see if we can get them to, to speak at our virtual event. So we're very, very happy. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Steve and Deborah. Thank we've you a lot. Thank we've enjoyed you. having you. And I didn't mention that you too will be receiving one of the coveted t-shirts from yeah. Um, yeah. the Aphasia Lab. <laughs> so we're here in person. I'll give it to you. You can put it on. So we will be sending that to you as well. Um, and thanks to your staff too, because um, everyone's been really great as far as coordinating and making sure that we we um, were able to put everything together and, and record and, and that kind of thing. So it, it's been seamless. I want to thank Constant Therapy. Um, they're a great, great supporter of us as well. They um, provided the one-year subscription that Olaf won. Also want to thank the Carolina Agency. This is a student agency here on campus at the University of South Carolina. And they actually did all of our promotional materials with the help of our social media um, guru, Annalise Nicolatis, who you saw in Drama Club just a little bit ago. Um, but they have done a fantastic job putting things together. They're in the School of Journalism at the, at the University of South Carolina. And of course, all of the folks who made this happen at the Aphasia Lab. We've got a great team here. And um, students, staff, faculty, everyone kind of pitched in to make this happen and come together. And, and I'm just really proud of, of the group that we have here. So let me tell you how to get involved. Oh, yeah, I want to tell you how to get involved in different things at the University of South Carolina. 
aphasia lab. Um, if you're interested in any resources, news events, um, and I'm gonna tell you about aphasia ambassador program a little bit more in depth here in a second, you can go to our website and that um, is on the screen right now or you can just Google U of SC aphasia lab to find us. Um, for the aphasia ambassador program, I do have a couple minutes, so I want to mention that this is a brand new program that we have. This was initiated by people in our uh, participants in our in our lab who thought it would be nice to be able to talk to someone who's had a stroke and aphasia right after people have had a stroke. So they kind of know what to expect and they have someone to talk to who's already been through it. So we have a group of volunteers some people with aphasia, some um, family members who are, and, and you can go to our website and find out more information, but they're available to go and talk to folks who just want to talk to someone else who's been through it. So you can get more information about that on our website. They've made a video that kind of introduces themselves and, and um, any of them are available right now. Of course, we're still meeting by Zoom, but they could Zoom with you or if you know someone who might benefit from that, um, please let us know. Some of them you just saw in the, in the drama club. So they're very active in all act, uh, activities at our lab. So um, we've already just started that one and, and already had someone that they spoke with. Um, also, if you're interested in participating in a clinical treatment study, we always have um, clinical treatment studies going on here at the lab. Um, <laughs> Steve mentioned that that's a nice way to get treatment um, where you don't have to pay for treatment. So we would welcome anyone who has aphasia who thinks that they would be interested in doing something with us. Um, right now we have one online study, it's totally online. So you don't have to be here in Columbia to participate in that study. And we're gonna be starting another large study um, in, probably in May. We're, we're kind of waiting to see what happens with the pandemic as far as when we can bring people back because that study involves br um, bringing people back. But we always have things in the pipeline. So I'm the person who kind of gets you set up and, and helps determine what study or studies you might be eligible for. Um, everyone does an initial evaluation with us so we can kind of find out um, what type of aphasia you, have, aphasia you have, the severity of your aphasia. Um, and a lot of people who are on this session today have, have volunteered their time to help us with these studies. Also, we have something called aphasia recovery groups. And these are groups that meet weekly. Um, we work with our graduate students in the communication sciences and disorders program. And, and they work under the supervision of a speech language pathologist. So these are therapy groups, but also support groups as well. So if you're interested in those, Lindsay is actually the, um, the person who coordinates those and leads, leads those. So um, you can contact me if you're interested in those and I can tell you how to get involved with that as well. Um, Lindsay, am I missing anything? As far as, um, we're gonna go on to Dirk next, I guess. I, I like to say, social media person, I like to figure out the social media person. For the the the, 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 the social media person, the, the to figure out. You're talking about in terms of sharing the. No, uh, one the, the, the ha, f five minutes ago you said social media. Oh, you're talking about our grad student who does our yeah. social media? Yeah, she's fantastic. We decided we had to get someone much younger than us to yes. do this since we don't get I, I agree. I'd like to suggest uh, to, uh, call me. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Annalise, did you yeah. hear that? Deb wants to talk yeah. to you. She's a, Annalise. Out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Annalise is a second year graduate student, so she'll be graduating soon, but she does this on the side. This is actually a business that she has on the side. So 
Who knows? She might be. Yeah, I like to. I, I got like, that now, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you better be. You better be careful. Leanne's afraid you're going to steal her. No. Yeah. <laughs> but but she has been fantastic. She she really has, and and um, we've loved all the stuff that she's done to promote this, but also, um, we'll. I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. Let me talk about um, Dirk. If you're interested in um, the aphasia drama group that you just saw them do the exercises, please contact um, Dirk Denouden. He's also the one who runs our C-Star lecture series. Typically the lecture series is more research-based, um, but we like to have one that's geared more towards therapists and people with aphasia and their family members. Um, so that's why we have the event today. So Dirk is your person to contact about those. And then finally, in regards to social media, um, I want to say, if you look in the chat, if you do not do um, Facebook, like Deb and Steve said, um, they put the link to Leo, Leora Cherney's um, survey in the chat room. So in case you, you don't do Facebook, and I know a lot of people don't, the chat uh, look in the chat room when that link is there. Um, so Annalise, let me go and go back to Annalise. So we we have uh, originally just had a Facebook page and um, Julia's had a Twitter, um, but she's done a great job of um, adding Instagram on here as well as YouTube and she's got everything coordinated and she knows her stuff. So if you are on any of these social media platforms, please follow those. Those are updated very regularly. And um, any events that we have coming up, we post things about other people's surveys and, and studies. So you can kind of keep up with what we're doing. And those are all the, um, the handles or names, you know, I'm old, I don't know what they're called, but anyway, uh, that's there. And I wanted to also mention that this um, has been recorded and will be posted on our website. So um, if you go to the CSTAR website, you can just Google CSTAR USC. Um, we'll give um, Dirk just a little while to, to get it downloaded and ready, but you can have access to this if you'd like to watch it again. Thank you, Deb and Steve, for letting us do that. All right, USC team, anything else I didn't say? I think Great job. I think we're good. Thanks to everyone who came. All right. We only ran two minutes over. Very nice. Thanks again, Deb and Steve. Bye. Everybody have a good rest of the week. Bye. Bye.